Let's lift up all that we are. Give him our highest praise, our highest worship. Hallelujah to the King of kings and the Lord of lords, the great I am, our Savior, our soon coming King. Lord, we lift up your name. Your word tells us that you inhabit, you come to remain, you come to remain where your praises are offered up. And today in this place, we offer up our highest praise to you. You are great. You are greatly to be praised. We thank you for victory in our lives. We thank you for your goodness. We thank you that you chose us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. I love you, Jesus. I love you, Father. We bless you. We exalt your name. Oh, magnify the Lord with me. Let us, let us exalt his name together. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you for your presence. In your presence, in your presence is fullness of joy. Hallelujah. Oh, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your joy, your peace, your mercy, your grace. So thankful in our hearts for all that you do for us, all that you are to us. Hallelujah. You're the true God, the living God. Praise your name. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord our God. Hallelujah. Praise God. You may be seated. Praise the Lord. I want to welcome you to Redemption Life Center. Those of you that have joined us online, we welcome you as well. We're so thankful that you're taking the time to be with us today. Um, David said, I was glad when they said to me, I was glad when they said to me, let us go to the house of the Lord. Are you glad to be here? Okay, let's try that one more time. Are you glad to be here? Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. It's good when we come together. Hebrews 10, 25 talks about that. It says to not forsake the assembling of yourselves together. You know, and I, I, there's a phrase in that scripture that I, that's in sort of, it's kind of funny to me. It goes on to say, as is the habit of some, you know, even back then they just didn't come to church. Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together to urge each other on, encourage one another, to bless each other. And you know, it's a blessing when we come together and it's an encouragement to see one another. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. I noticed, and I said this in the first service that when I was just making a few notes about announcements today, that I had three scriptures in the announcements. And I know that when you, when you use the Bible three times in just the announcements, it's going to be a phenomenal service. You know that. In 1 Corinthians 12, 28, the Bible talks about the gifts of helps or the ministry of helps. And we have opportunities here for you to get involved in that ministry. Everything that we have going on here, you know, from Life Kids Church, ushers, greeters, um, the uh, praise and worship team, all of the things we do, recovery works, all of it is ministry. It's not just we're trying to put a body somewhere to just fill a slot. It is ministry, all that we do here. And so when you uh, get involved with the youth, the junior, senior youth, or whatever in the media ministry, all of it, working together to advance the kingdom and to be a blessing to other people. So we have opportunities for you to get involved here at church. Uh, those opportunities are listed in the guest center. There's sign-up sheets there. And if you have a desire to be a blessing to people, get involved in your church. You know, I've seen it over and over again in, in 20 plus years of ministry, how I've watched people that just simply said, I want to just do something. Is there something I can do here? To, to, to be involved. And when they just have a heart to get involved, God begins to bless them over and over. They get promotions. Their children get blessed. I'm not saying he doesn't do that for other people, but I've just watched people uh, as, as they got involved in their church and began to serve and work and be a blessing to others. Blessings just came to them just from nowhere. Things that just like promotions, better jobs, uh, increase came to them in, in all different areas. So let me encourage you, get involved 
in our local church right here and be a blessing to other people. Uh, we'll receive your offering at the end of the service. All right. We're going to conclude a series we started a few weeks ago, so I'm glad to see all of you this morning. And uh, boy, this weather's teasing me. You know, I kind of want to let my guard down and just believe that it's going to stay this warm, but it just doesn't always work that way, so enjoy it today. But uh, if you have your Bibles or if you have your phones or whatever you have, uh, go with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 12. And uh, we've had a, a series going talking about the supernatural church. And so uh, I want to bring that to a conclusion today. And uh, we've listed several things while you get that passage open. We're going to start in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 and verse 1. But uh, the church is the body of Christ. You know, Paul refers to the church as a body. And um, it really as the body of Christ. And so uh, the church is global. The church is local, right? There's local churches that the Lord put his stamp of approval on. He, he addressed local churches. If God didn't want there to be local churches and he just wanted all the Christians to worship him on their own, then he would have said, listen here, church at Smyrna, uh, you shouldn't be a church. <laughs> Sorry. I'm just saying, you know, it makes sense. You know, people say, well, you know, we really don't need to go to church. Not according to the Lord. Actually, it's important to him. Now, what happens there is important, right? And not everything that happens in church is God-ordained. How many of you found that out? <laughs> Said, uh, you know, there's a lot of things we could say about that, but we don't need to. But the truth of the matter is, is that God has ordained Jesus said I will build my church so he's ordained the church locally now I believe that local churches that have uh, a mission from God God ordained local churches have a mission to carry out locally to be the body of Christ locally and then have further reach than that and then we know that the church is uh, across the world and then Paul said in uh, Ephesians chapter 3, I bow my knees unto the Father of my, uh, our Lord Jesus Christ, from whom the whole family in heaven and earth is named. So we know the body of Christ actually goes beyond those that are here, but actually all the way into heaven, the body of Christ. Isn't that amazing? Uh, I love what Hebrews 12 says, that therefore seeing that we're surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us run our race with endurance, looking unto Jesus, the author and perfecter of our faith, who for the joy set before him endured the cross. In other words, all of those in the body of Christ that have gone on before us are in the grandstands of heaven cheering you on. Amen. That's right. Amen. Amen. That's good That's news, right? right? And they want to see you do the will of God. They want to see you carry out everything God's called you to do, accomplish his purposes for your life, and advance the kingdom of God. Amen. The kingdom of God is to be an aggressive advancement. Amen. That's right. Not the world. Come on now. There's so much faith in the world's darkness and so much faith in society's darkness and not enough confidence in the power of Christ that's in the church. You know, come on now. Is he in us? Does he, if any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things passed away. Are you in Christ? Amen. Amen. You must look pretty good in Christ. Now, I know you don't look too good out of him, but you look good in Christ. In Christ. If any man be in Christ. I love what Galatians 2.20 says. It is no longer I who lives, but Christ who lives in me. Amen. Woo, man. Giddy up, right? Christ lives in you. Well, if he lives in you, don't you think he's the same as he's always been and wants to do what he's always done? Amen. If he can just get a little bit of cooperation. That's right. Amen. Amen. Right? Amen. Amen. <laughs> Praise the Lord. All right. Everyone sit back down. We're almost done. And <laughs> we'll be done soon. Curb your enthusiasm. But uh, the church is to be supernatural. It's the body of Christ. In other words, the church is not to be, I like what Lester Sumrall said, it's not to be a referral center where we say, well, you know, I know who can really help you with that problem. No, the church has 
power to help people. The church has power to bring freedom, not because we're somebody, but because of what Jesus has done. He is the resurrected one. He is the one who entered into spiritual death and conquered it for all of mankind, and we are the proclaimers of those eternal truths. And if his power ever sets somebody free, it can do it again. If it ever heals somebody, it can do it again. And if it ever did anything for anybody, it can do it again. Unless he's changed. Right? So we got plenty of scripture, right? I'm God, and I change often. No, that's not what it says. <laughs> that's what the, you know, a lot of religious people preach. I'm God, I change often. That's what my, my daughter does. I am grace and I change often. I'm like, how many times are you going to go into the closet and change? But anyhow, no, he said, I'm God and I change not. Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, right? Well, where is he? Well, he's in the church. Why hadn't it looked that way? We haven't known it or we hadn't believed it. Not you. I'm talking about somebody else, but... So 1 Corinthians 12, we talked about there's a supernatural birth, right? Let me just recap a little bit because we're going to end it today. Supernatural birth. It wasn't normal. It's It's not natural to be born again. The church doesn't offer natural help. No, the church offers supernatural help beyond the natural. Come on now. Jesus said, no man can see these things. No man can enter the kingdom of God unless he be born again. Nicodemus was a devout religious leader. He said, how's that going to (laughs) happen? You know, scientifically that doesn't work. Jesus said, Nicodemus, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. You've been born once in the flesh, but you need to be born again in the spirit. You're going to be born again of God. One translation closer to the original Greek says, you must be refathered from above. In other words, the new birth is a supernatural birth whereby the spirit of man is born again out of the spirit of God. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away and all things have become new. Old things have passed. We, we've not, we, we, sh- we could spend so much time just talking about the new birth, being born again. What does it mean to be born again? It means the old things passed away. What old things? Everything that was in you before you got born again. That's right. T.L. Osborne said, weak eye moved out, or little eye moved out, and big Christ moved in. Amen. Amen. Ooh, man. We must be born again. All things have passed away. That means that they have died. They have ceased. Paul said, I was crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The new birth is Christ uh, recreating the human spirit after the nature of his triumphant work. Come on now. It's not your passport to heaven. You've been born again. It's not a feeling. It's not a goosebump. You have been born again. You are not what you used to be. Those things are no longer attached to you. You are no longer associated with them. If any man be in Christ, he's a new creature. Old things have passed away. All things have become new. Not most things. Most things would be good. How many of you would take most things? Most things have become new. There's still a few little hiccups, but most things have become new. No, we're being trained to put more confidence in the frailty of our flesh than we are the triumph of the Spirit. And you can put to death the weaknesses of the flesh and the weaknesses of the old man by identifying appropriately with who you are in Christ. Amen. Amen. I mean, it might just do you good. I, in fact, I dare you to do it. Some people need that. You know, I dare you to do it. Well, I'll tell you. I'll take you up on that. I dare you to do it. Walk around and say, I'm a new creature in Christ. Old things have passed away. Fearful me has passed away. Amen. Sick me, defeated me, insecure me has passed away. 
all things have become new. I am in Christ. Christ is in me. I am in Christ. Christ is in me. How many, I think it was Wigglesworth, anyhow, one of them said, many Christians are defeated because they don't have a bold confession of who they are in Christ. I mean, it's pretty supernatural what happened when you got born again. It really should radically alter the rest of your life on this earth. It knocked the P off of, or the S off of Paul's name and put a P there. Supernatural. You've been born again. Now, how many of you believe that? Amen. I mean, it's right there in the Bible, right? Now, when you think about that, those things will begin to work in your life. If you begin to see them, they'll begin to affect your life. If any man be in Christ, I'm in Christ. He's a new creature. I'm a new creature. Old things passed away. All things become new. Now, all these things, what? All these new things are from God. There isn't anything in your born-again human spirit that isn't from God. Say la. Nothing. We'll say, well, then why do I struggle with this or why do I deal with that? Because you have to renew your mind. How much time of the day have you spent thinking that way? Come on now, if you think there's a boogeyman in the closet, you're going to act accordingly, even though there isn't a boogeyman. And I know that sounds foolish, but I also know that most adults in here won't let their foot hang off the side of the bed at nighttime. So, <laughs> so whether you believe it or not, you act according to what you think and according to what, as a man thinks in his heart. So, right? So, you know, you pull your foot up real quick. Takes one thought. Doesn't take long. Say, whoop, just in case. I don't think there is, but just in case. Nobody wants to find out the hard way, you know? Say, that sucker got me. He got me. He was there. <laughs> no. So we think that way, right? We align, and then we present our body as what? A living sacrifice. Well, I've never really sacrificed anything, but I don't imagine they like it. Hmm? It's probably a little bit uncomfortable for the animals that were sacrificed, isn't it? He said, present your body. In other words, your flesh is not who you are. Stop letting your flesh make you think you are that. You know, the devil's so subtle. Now, we have to talk about gifts of the Spirit, but I'm just going to flow with this for a little bit. We have to. The, the enemy is subtle. He's, he's deceptive. He's manipulative. And he'll get in your mind. He works through your thought life in a tremendous way. And what he'll do is he'll insert thoughts into your mind that you dwell on. Then he'll make you think you thought of that. And so we take ownership of thoughts sometimes. How many of you don't raise your hand? Let me double say that because every time you say that, somebody raises their hand, you know. So, <laughs> I was in a service. <laughs> never mind. Uh, <laughs> we don't have time for that story. Uh, you've had a thought and, right, you fe- immediately felt bad. I can't believe I thought that. Right? The enemy will put those kind of thoughts and make you think that's who you are. That's what you want. That's what you have the feelings that go with it. Feelings, oh, feeling. But feelings were never meant to govern you. Just because you feel something doesn't mean you are that. You are what God says you are. God says you're a new creature in Christ. So if I'm a new creature in Christ, whether I feel like it or not, I'm a new creature in Christ. Go on down to verse 21 of 2 Corinthians chapter 5. It says, I'm the righteousness of God in Christ. That means I'm not trying to be. I am the righteousness of God in Christ. Why? Because he who knew no sin was made sin for me. That I might become. Or one translation says that I might be made sin the righteousness of God in Christ. And so we have to apprehend, the Bible says, capturing, 2 Corinthians chapter 10, capturing every thought and bringing it into submission to the obedience of Christ. Some of you got some uncaptured thoughts, right? And they're hiding out in the caves of your mind. And you got to go in, you got to apprehend those thoughts and say, I am not that. You know, the Bible calls 
itself. <laughs> you know, the Bible refers to Scripture as the perfect law of liberty, but then also a mirror, a mirror. In other words, when you read the epistles, the letters written to the churches, Romans, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians, Ephesians, Galatians, all those, the letters written to the churches, you're looking into a mirror of who you are in the Spirit. And you think about just Ephesians chapter 1 where Paul prayed for the church at Ephesus. I pray that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of glory, may give to you a spirit of wisdom and revelation, <clears throat> not in the knowledge of your frailties, in the knowledge of him. Amen. The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling, what are the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints, what's the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe. How many of you think Jesus has some power? Amen. The exceeding greatness of his powers towards you who believe. This, that's in accordance with the working of the strength of your might, which you worked in Christ when you raised him, listen, raised him from the dead and seated him at your right hand in the heavenly places. Far Far above all principality, power, might, and dominion, and every name that is named, not only in this age, but also in that which is to come. And you gave him to be head over all things to the church, which is his body. And then chapter 2, verse 6 says, and you raised us up with him Amen. and seated us Amen. with him. Amen. That's who you are in Christ. That's where you are in Christ. That happened in the new birth. I had a real interesting experience one time in prayer. If you've never had an interesting experience in prayer, you haven't stayed there long enough. <laughs> and I'm not talking about a craving for a sandwich. How many of you ever started to pray and you remembered everything you ever forgot? <laughs> you had a list, your mind was erased as soon as you walked into Walmart. I think that's what those things are. They're not theft protection, they're mind erasers that you forget what you came for and you go straight to the cookies. It's programmed. I don't know how they do it, but I'm convinced. It works every time. <laughs> and, and then when you pray, you say, my goodness, I remember everything I, fought, I forgot from third grade on. Which for me was not a lot. But anyhow, in prayer, I remember I was praying one time and I was really going through a challenge, a crisis for me. I was going through a real tough time and it was a really... You ever gone through a hard time? It's like phys it drains you physically. It's like really challenging, right? Maybe just me, but anyhow. Very, very tough. It wasn't a physical situation, but it was like very draining. Like it, it you know, my goodness. <clears throat> and so I was supposed to meet my friends and pray. Woo! I was like, I'd rather not. <laughs> Sometimes when you need to praise, when you feel like least praying, you know, and so supposed to go meet them. And on top of that, I was supposed to get up early and pray before school. I was like, I don't even want to get to school on time, much less pray. I was in Bible school at the time. I'm sure you have a lot of confidence in me now as a preacher. Huh? I said, my goodness. And uh, it felt like this whole thing was just on top of me. You know what I mean? You ever, and it just seemed like this thing weighed me down and... and uh, so I walked in and said, "Woo, hallelujah, let's pray. And, you know, I really just wanted to sit down and go into my little corner and <laughs> be forgotten. I started praying, and just something in me hates to give up, you know. I said, you know, I really don't want to let this thing beat me. And so I'm just praying, 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 praying. Then all of a sudden, it was like something sucked me off the earth. Oh, and all of a sudden, I began to see that situation, and I saw myself seated next to God in Christ. And then I started to look for that problem, and I just started laughing. I said, that's what that was? That little thing? That was controlling my life, that was controlling my emotions, that caused my stomach to be in knots? That little thing right there? I saw it from a perspective of reality. You know, I left there different. I said, that thing's defeated. Amen. I'll Amen. never bow down to that again. That thing is defeated. And I walked out of there, and I had it. That was it. I laughed. I had such a good day. And why? Because, not because it became true then, it's because I saw it as truth. The moment you see it as truth is when it begins to work. 
That's why you say meditate the word until it becomes real to you. Don't meditate it. I know that's what the scripture says. I know that all makes sense. But meditate it until something in your spirit jumps. That's right. Amen. Right? And that's what the power of meditation will do. We're to meditate these things. There's a lot you could meditate. Paul said meditate these things. And so we have a supernatural birth. And really, if you just spent time dwelling on that, you know, they say, well, if I could just get back the joy of my salvation, you know, different things like that. Well, those are just people who forgot what happened to them. Say, well, how could that happen? The children of Israel forgot that they were brought out from the land of Egypt and crossed through the Red Sea. How many of you ever thought about that and said, I would never do what they did? (laughs) And yet we do it. So anybody could do that, forget what God's done in their life, but if you keep it before you. David dwelt on the faithfulness of God, and he overcame future obstacles by dwelling on God's past faithfulness. He said, now wait a minute, this challenge looks bigger than ever before, but you delivered me from the lion, you delivered me from the bear, I killed Goliath, I've been in the hills, once even I was young and now I'm old and I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his descendants begging bread. You got to dwell on these realities. Well, we have a supernatural birth. You, 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 God lives in you. Now, don't let the, the world's strange and religion is strange. They say, we're all children of God. No, that's not true. Jesus called a group of people the, the children of the devil. Paul called a man a child of the devil. So apparently there's two families, God's family and the devil's family. And all people are not God's children. And I knew that's about what we'd get, you know, somebody, we got one throat clear. That's, that's very good. But it's true, right? The world, the world have you say, oh, everyone's okay. We're just all going to heaven. Just let people love. Is love. No, 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 no. There is a devil and there is a God. There is a heaven and there is a hell. And if you're born again, you are born into the kingdom of God, and it is through Jesus Christ that you have this supernatural birth. Now, don't get me wrong. God's not trying to keep people out of heaven, right? The other thing religion does is that God's up there with a, with a uh, you know, it's, it's hard to get in. It's harder to join some churches than it is to get into heaven. <laughs> you can be people in heaven who's like, I couldn't even join the church, but I made it here at least, you know, my goodness. But we've been born again supernaturally. There are two kingdoms. There's the kingdom of darkness and there's the kingdom of God's dear son. Amen. And when you're born again, you are transferred. Now, we've got to let those realities. Now, if we're transferred out of the kingdom, and this, we'll just leave it here. I think this is good enough. If we're transferred out of the kingdom of darkness and into the kingdom of God's dear son, then that means everything that darkness is no longer has power over you. Amen. 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 You know, as a kid, there's a song called Can't Touch This. You remember that song, you know? And so I didn't wear the right pants today, so I won't sing it. But, you know, maybe next week. We'll pray about it. <laughs> but in other words, now, now, you've been transferred out of the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear son. The powers of darkness are no longer your rule. They're no longer your authority. They're no longer your boss. That's right. Amen. So stop listening to them. Live out of the kingdom of God's dear son. So we're supernaturally born again. Jesus delegated his authority to the church before he went to heaven. You can see that in Matthew 28, Mark 16, and then all through the New Testament, not one scripture in the New Testament tells us to ask God to stop the devil. That's right. Every scripture in the New Testament that talks about dealing with the devil tells the Christian to have authority over the devil. You resist him. You uh, uh, give him no place. You do it. Amen. Amen. Right? So in other words, in the new birth, Jesus put in every believer more than enough adequacy to overcome the devil. You're not called to be afraid. Of, not, not one verse says be afraid of the devil. Doesn't mean it's not real because there are a lot of verses. Peter said, be sober, be vigilant. 
For your adversary, the devil, walks about like a roaring lion. He's looking for somebody to devour. But resist him steadfast. Well, it must do something to resist him. You must have authority over him if you can resist him. Amen. There must be something in you that's greater than what's in him if you can resist him. Amen. But he won't be resisted unless you do it. So that means there's going to be times in the life of the believer. And I know people don't like to, you know, uh, the devil's funny where he'll make you feel weird about something. You know, people say, well, I feel weird saying I resist the devil. I can't see him. Well, you talk to your car and you talk to all kinds of stuff. This stupid remote. How many of you ever said that? Not me, but I've heard a few times people say that, you know. But there's going to be times in every believer's life where you have to say, devil, I resist you. Amen. And it might be, you're not resisting a, a horned being, you know, with a tail and a pitchfork. You're not, you're resisting whatever, whenever you resist what he comes to do, you're resisting him. Amen. So if he comes with fear, you tell it, fear, I resist you. You're a spirit. God's not given me a spirit of fear. I resist you. Amen. You know what it'll do? It'll flee. Doubt, I resist you. Symptoms, I resist you. Amen. Hmm? Amen. God didn't say he'd do that for us. He said you resist him. Amen. You stead, uh, steadfastly resist him in your faith, right? So we've been given authority. It's not going to be exercised except through you. Now, we have to learn these things. I'm not into religious teaching. I want to get into what the Bible says because we have this one shot in our generation to make a difference. And I prayed a long time ago before I ever started pastoring, before I ever got any depth into ministry. I said, Jesus, help me tell people about you like you would. And I just don't imagine Jesus would stand up here and say, now, you be careful. It's 2021, and I had no idea things were going to get this bad. So you better be careful because there's some stuff out there that, and, and, then, and then Facebook, whew, you know, you just, just be afraid. One lady stood up in church, this is a true story, stood up in church and said, thus saith the Lord, it's okay if you get a little scared. I get a scared too. <laughs> no, that's not, <laughs> no, that's not, that's not, uh, the Lord's not in heaven wondering what's he going to do next. Not even close, right? Not even close. Not even close. He knows. He knows I am the triumphant one. He knows I am the rock of ages. I am the ancient of days. Nothing shall get in the way of my purpose. And my No, he's almighty God. El Shaddai. Almighty God. The more than enough God. Amen. That's who he is. He's more than enough for 2021. He's more than enough for anything you'll ever face. He is Jehovah God, the self-existent, uncreated, almighty, resurrected, devil-stomping, grave-busting God. Amen. And he's your father, and he's your Lord. And he said, now I want you to be bold and courageous, not scared and afraid. And so we resist everything that's of the devil, and God backs us up. Amen. Amen. So we want to walk in that. We want to demonstrate that. We want to live in that. Not just in church. It's easy in church. Woohoo! And then you leave. You say, oh, Jesus, what are we going to do? No, this needs to be real in you at home, in bed, in the middle of the night when the enemy tries to wake you up and say, how's this ever going to change? You say, you're a liar. Right. I won't Amen. be afraid. Amen. I'll let Wigglesworth tell the story. When he woke up, he said, there's an evil presence in my room. And look, and behold, there's an enemy standing right there. He said, it's just you. Rolled over and went to sleep. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's funny. I, I, I heard. <laughs> well, anyhow, we're running out of time. Heard a lot of stories. But anyhow, we want to live. And so we supernatural authority. We've been uh, positioned for power. Jesus said I, he commanded them to receive the baptism of the Holy Spirit. That's for today. Acts chapter 2, verse 39 says, This is for you, your children, and your children's children, and as many as who are afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. As long as God's calling people, he's baptizing them in the Holy Spirit. And he's baptizing Amen. them the same as he baptized them in the book of Acts. Amen. And so, 
we've been positioned for power. We talked about the name of Jesus. Wow, isn't that wonderful? In my name. We talked about love, and then today uh, we're going to real quick run through the gifts of the Spirit, all right? Let me read uh, with you, if you would, Second, 1 Corinthians chapter 12. <laughs> Every preacher has to send you there for, you know, early and then come back to it. I hate that. You know, in church, you know, I've, I've been, you know, look at the verse, look up, look at the verse, look up. And you just say, would you just read the verse, please? 1 Corinthians 12, verse 1. Now concerning spiritual gifts, brethren, I did not want you to be ignorant. You know that you were Gentiles carried away to these dumb idols, however you were led. Therefore I make known to you that no one speaking by the Spirit of God calls Jesus accursed, and no one can say that Jesus is Lord except by the Holy Spirit. There are diversities of gifts, but the same Spirit. There are differences of ministries, but the same Lord. And there are diversities of activities, but the same God who works all in all. But the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. To one is given the word of wisdom through the Spirit, to another the word of knowledge through the same Spirit, to another faith by the same Spirit, to another gifts of healings by the same Spirit, to another the working of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another different kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues. But one and the same Spirit works all these things, distributing to each one individually as he wills. So we see that this is a manifestation of the Spirit as the Spirit wills. Uh, the problem that has happened is many people have tried to foster a manifestation of the Spirit, and he wasn't involved. And it was evident. Whenever the Holy Spirit's in activity, whenever it's the Spirit of God, no matter how unusual it is to the natural mind, it will bless the people. But if it's, you ever been to service where somebody did something supposedly by the Holy Spirit and it's like someone dumped a bucket of cold water on the whole service? Ooh, it just wasn't, well. So let's look at a couple things real quick. Number one, the word gifts is italicized. Verse one, concerning spiritual gifts. Uh, when a word is italicized, it means that it was added for understanding, but is not in the original language. So really in the original Greek, it says this, now concerning spirituals, or now concerning things or manifestations of the Holy Spirit. And that matches the context even because if you go down, it actually says these manifestations. So uh, really, he says concerning manifestations or concerning things pertaining to the Holy Spirit. What did he say? I don't want you ignorant. Now that's interesting because I was told by church people a lot that you just have to be ignorant. And boy, we embraced it wholeheartedly. <laughs> but actually the Bible says that even concerning the Holy Spirit in these manifestations, I don't want you ignorant. So number one, it shows us that you don't have to be ignorant. That at some point, ignorance might just be a choice. So you don't have to be ignorant. So God said, I don't want you ignorant. So number two, we know that God's will is not for you to be ignorant. God wants you to know about these things and not be ignorant. If you don't know about them, you can't cooperate with them when the Holy Spirit moves. I was laughing. I said this in the first service because we're going to be uh, we're going to be out for a couple services. We've got uh, I'm going to be preaching in Lexington for Jasmine's grandpa. He had uh, two knee replacement surgery. He just did it all in one. So uh, so I'm going to go preach there Sunday, and then the, the next Wednesday I'm going to be in Louisiana at a leadership conference. So I was laughing last night. I was sitting in bed laughing because I thought you know what, I'm getting ready to drive to Louisiana and I just feel like I might, you know, for those of you that have heard the stories, I'm gonna have to stop at some gas stations and just pray for me. <laughs> because it seems like every time I go on a trip and stop at a gas station, the Lord always points somebody out and tells me to go preach to them. And, I'm, and always, I'm always like, I just want a Diet Coke and a bag of chips. That's all I want to do, and fill up with gas and hit the road. But the, it's so, anyhow, I have like a gas station anointing. But, uh, if we're not responsive to the Holy Spirit and we're ignorant of them, then we can't cooperate with him. I told this story in the first service that, uh, and uh, we got to move, baby. We got to move. It's okay. Does everybody else agree? <laughs> Somebody said, I'll tell you that lady. I'm going to get that. <laughs> uh, I'll stop when I hear stomachs growling. So there's a, couple, there's a couple ways to look at it. You know, one person said, every preacher ought to be like Pharaoh and let God's people go. <laughs> 
But then Paul preached all night, all day and all night, and somebody actually fell out of a window and died. <laughs> and apparently didn't affect the offering. Yeah, I mean, you know, it's <laughs> And he just raised them from the dead, you know. So if you die, then we'll just raise you up. So now if you die outside of church, you're on your own. But uh, no. We'll... <laughs> so anyhow, I was uh, telling the story in the first service, talking about not being ignorant. God doesn't want us ignorant. Even of things pertaining to the Holy Spirit, manifestations of the Holy Spirit, he does not want us ignorant. Uh, I, it was my first year in Bible school, and um, one of the ladies that went to Bible school with us actually worked in the hospice ward of a very large hospital in Tulsa. So she came and she said, I have this opportunity um, where my boss has granted me permission to invite Rama students, Bible school students, to come and pray for people in the hospice ward. And so, you know, the hospice ward is where they're just keeping them comfortable until they pass. So they said, you need to be smart, you know, because you get around Bible school students and, you know, whoa, you get all the weirdness, you know. I remember, I got a word, I got a word, I got a word. And I don't know one of the words that ever was true, but, you know, there's, what's, uh, uh, zealous with no knowledge, I think is how Paul described it. So she said, you got to, you know, we believe that God does miracles. We want to pray for these people. However, you have to abide by these guidelines. You can ask the person in the room if they want prayer. And if they do, you can talk to them and engage them. You're not allowed to, if they ask questions, you know, in other words, you're not allowed to kick in the door and say, Wah! you know, and cause ruckus or else the hospital's going to kick you out. Now, that's pretty phenomenal. If you know anything today, I don't know any hospitals that would allow Bible school students to come in and offer prayer to the terminal. So we really wanted to reverence that op opportunity and, and reach people who were hopeless, according to the world. Talking about not being ignorant of spiritual gifts. And so, you know, uh, I'm in Bible school, so we said, man, absolutely, let's go. And so we went, and uh, I remember I got there, and, uh, and this is how I, I prayed in the parking lot. We pulled up into the parking lot, and I prayed, and I said, God, now, you said go lay hands on the sick and they'll recover. So we're going to do that. And if there's anything that we need, if we need a gift of the Spirit, if we need a manifestation, if we, whatever we need, we just believe you that we'll have whatever we need. And we're going to go pray for these people. But we just know that in Jesus' name, there's authority over the works of the devil. And so off we went. <clears throat> And we went to the first room, and we're praying for an uh, older gentleman. He's laying in there. He accepted our offer to pray. And uh, there wasn't a lot of, you know, nothing really happened. You know, we thought, well, you know, he's kind of interested. I don't know. I almost wonder if he just was ready to go because he just was like, you know, thank you. Appreciate it. Well, a uh, uh, man and his wife heard us praying. So uh, they came in and said, hey, we don't mean to interrupt, but whenever you finish here, our son is in this room. We're Christians. We believe in healing. Would you please come pray for him? We said, absolutely. So he's an adult. He's a grown man, adult son. And here's his parents. And there he is in the bed and uh, no hope. So we walked in his room. We finished up there. We walked in the room, and uh, I'm standing on his right side, my left side of the bed, and there's another person or two next to me, and then there's a couple other friends, and then his parents were on, like, the opposite side of the bed. And so we all joined hands. Well, you don't have to join hands, but I don't know why we did, but we just did. And uh, I always try not to if we can avoid it. But anyhow, <laughs> uh, and this is pre-coronavirus, you know. I just know people are nasty, so... Uh, <laughs> Say, I believe in healing, but you're gross. <laughs> and, and, but we all joined hands. And I remember, as soon as we started praying, God, Father, we just lift up this situation to you. This man's here dying, and uh, this is not your will. And so we just know that there's power. As soon as we started praying, boy, I knew in my spirit, I'm that, ooh, praying. You know, how many of you know when you're praying and, and it's, you know. You're... And then this came to me. They told us what was wrong with him said that's why he was dying they said uh you know this is what's going on and this is what needs to change so i'm praying and then all of a sudden i'm praying you know quote unquote minding my own business just praying all of a sudden 
this word comes to me. What his parents said is wrong with him is only partially true. That's what's happening, but this is what's causing it. And this is why. Tell them that you know that. Well, the Lord's trying to reach them and supernaturally show them. And talking about not being ignorant of these things, I said, Ooh, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> In my mind, not out loud, because if I made a mistake, if I said that and that was not true, we might have gotten into a fight with the parents. Yeah, it was a big deal. Their son's dying, and then for me to say what the Lord showed me, woo. I said, Lord, I don't think so, but, you know, please heal him. Please help him. And the Lord said, I really need you to just tell him that what they said isn't the cause. This is the cause, and this is why. And so I never did. We said amen, and we walked out, and the whole time, something in here, I knew. I missed it. I missed it. Well, what are we talking about? Not being ignorant of these things. We need to know. See, there's a part of me that said, what if that's just me? Well, if I was less ignorant of these things, I would know that there's no way in the world that those specific thoughts would enter my mind. How in the world would God make known to me with such clarity the disease he had and how he had it. There's no way. And, but in my mind, I was like, man, you know, I think I don't want to say that. Well, you're talking about not being ignorant of these things. So I left. Now, the lady who went to school with us, who worked in the hospital, she couldn't really talk a lot. But I saw, you know, because of uh, legal, you can't tell uh, people outside of what's wrong with people medically. So I saw her in school. I said, hey, whatever happened, we prayed for someone. Because she came and she told us, she said, hey, his parents were so happy you came. They, 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 and, and I felt horrible because I knew I didn't do what God told me to do. So I felt here his parents are. This supernatural thing happened. And I didn't say it. I hate that. I still, it still bothers me. Now, he's in heaven because we made sure of that. I told the Lord, I'm not going to get everything right, I don't think. So just help me not to send anybody to hell. I prayed that a long time ago. I'm really serious. I did. I said, Lord, I, I want to be bold for you, but please just help me not cause anybody to miss heaven. Well, I, I thank God that man's in heaven, but he could have been on the earth. I said, whatever happened? Yeah, what did she said, unfortunately, he died. And uh, in here, I knew, ugh. I said, hey, what was wrong with him? You know, I was 20. I didn't know about HIPAA and all this. She said, I, you know, I can't tell you. I said, oh, yeah, of course you can. I said, uh, I said, well, let me tell you something. I said, this is what was wrong with him in the hospital, right? She said, yeah, yeah, that was. I said, but this is what caused it. She said, what? How'd you know that? I said, and this is why. This is the whole story behind it from his life. She said, who told you those things? I said, nobody told me. I said, the Lord told me when I was standing there, and I didn't say it. And I remember, I remember being ignorant, right? Missed it. Think about if we aren't ignorant, God's not just, do you know God loves people? He's trying to rescue people. That's right. Amen. And these manifestations and demonstrations of the Holy Spirit are available to all believers, not just preachers. And we see in the, in the Gospels, Ananias. Remember Ananias in Acts where, where Saul was on the road to Damascus and the light shined from heaven and knocked him off the horse and, and he went to Damascus and then the Lord appeared to a certain disciple named Ananias. You know what a disciple is? It's a church member. And Jesus appeared to just a, a Christian, right? These things are for the body of Christ. And told him, gave him a word of knowledge, a word of wisdom, and said, go and tell Saul, you know, and I've showed him, these. he began to talk to him. Well, Ananias could have never, would have never known that a man named Paul was in this house waiting to be prayed for. But God revealed it. So these gifts of the Spirit, real quick, let me just go through, is uh, he doesn't want us ignorant of them. Now, a uh, couple things to note is that whenever they're in operation, they magnify the lordship of Jesus. So if somebody does something and they claim it to be the Holy Spirit and it magnifies them or magnifies people, it's not the Holy Spirit. The, you know, Paul said that if any man speaks by the Spirit of God, he, he cannot call Jesus accursed, 
speaking by the Spirit of God, neither can he call Jesus Lord. Well, we know anybody could repeat the words Jesus is Lord, but they can't say it by the Spirit. In other words, anytime the Spirit manifests, it magnifies the Lordship of Jesus. Think about what would have happened in that hospital room if I would have said, Jesus shows me that this is what's wrong with you and this is why and he wants to heal you right now. What would that have done? Would that have made me look cool? No, that would have magnified the lordship of Jesus. Amen. Amen. And sometimes people need that type of thing to get their mind past the fear of not receiving. But anytime the Holy Spirit man manifests himself and magnifies the lordship of Jesus, uh, and then also, whenever these gifts are in operation, notice it says it's for the profit of all. In other words, the manifestations of the Holy Spirit, no matter how unusual they are to the natural mind, they will always add something to you and not take something from you. In other words, if somebody stands up and says, the Spirit shows me that you have a dirty past and that, you know, the Lord will never manifest something to embarrass you. Smith Wigglesworth said, the Holy Spirit always reveals the blood of Christ, Amen. what his blood did, that he washed you, that he cleansed you. And the Holy Spirit, <clears throat> anytime he's in manifestation, will always strengthen you to go forward in God. He won't embarrass you in front of a lot of people. Come on, Jesus hung on the cross sh in shame so that you don't have to live in it. And so, uh, it always is for the profit of all. Isn't that what he said in verse 7? That uh, the, spirit, the, uh, the manifestation of the Spirit is given to each one for the profit of all. For the profit of all. So God wants to add to you. The manifestations of the Holy Spirit are for the benefit, not the detriment of humanity. All of these gifts are supernatural. Some have said and some have taught that, that you know, knowledge is just God's gifted some people in knowledge, God's gifted some people with wisdom. But what happens when you come to miracles? Miracles aren't normal, <laughs> right? That's why they're miracles. If it were normal, it wouldn't be a miracle. A, a miracle is divine intervention in the ordinary course of nature. So if one of these gifts are supernatural, then all of them are supernatural. He's not talking about human wisdom. He's talking about supernatural wisdom. It's really a revelation. So these gifts can be divided. These nine gifts can be divided for the sake of study into three categories, even though the apostle doesn't do that. There's three of these nine gifts that manifest or reveal something. There's three of them that demonstrate power and three of them that have to do with speech. And so let's just define them real quick and then we'll conclude the series, all right? And everybody said, amen. Yeah, I... uh, word of wisdom, the, the revelation gifts or gifts that reveal is the word of wisdom, the word of knowledge, and discerning of spirits. Now, a word is a fragmentary portion of a sentence. God has all wisdom, but when a word of wisdom is, is in manifestation, he gives a fragment of his wisdom to the person for the profit of all, right? So the word of wisdom always deals with something in the future. And sometimes he'll give you a word of wisdom so that you can either prepare for what God is doing in the future or so that you can pray to change something that's coming. Remember when Hezekiah was told by Isaiah the prophet, put your house in order because you're gonna die. And Isaiah left. Hezekiah turned away from everything. He turned to the wall and began to cry out to God. In other words, sometimes God will give you a word of wisdom and say, this is how this is going to end if things don't change. Or in other words, this is how this is going to end under the current circumstances. But did you know sometimes you can make an adjustment, you can pray, or you can change the current circumstances. In this case, Hezekiah cried out to God and changed his own self. He said, whoa, hey, God, God, turned away from everything, turned to the wall. And before Isaiah left, the word of the Lord came to, came to him again and said, Isaiah, go back and tell Hezekiah, I have heard your prayers, I have seen your tears, and surely I will heal you. Well, that must have meant that he wanted him healed. Amen. But in the current situation, as things were, Hezekiah would have died. Remember Abraham? 
God said, I, I can't do this unless I tell my friend Abraham. Did you know you can walk intimately with God and not be caught off guard at all? Did you know that God desires to have relationship with humanity? That he says, I'm going to do something, but not before we talk about it. That's pretty cool, huh? So a word of wisdom deals with the future, sometimes to pray for it to change, or sometimes to pray for it to happen the way God said, or sometimes to prepare, right? Word of wisdom. Word of knowledge always deals, it's a revelation of God's knowledge, it deals with the present or past. That's like with Ananias, the Lord told him, Paul, Saul is in this city, in this house, and he saw a vision of a man named Ananias coming to pray for him. Well, that's the present and past. No way he could have known that unless God revealed to him, gave him a word of knowledge. Discerning of spirits is not the gift of discernment. I've heard many people say, what's well, the gift of discernment? That you discern, uh, you know, it's not discerning. Uh, actually, Smith Wigglesworth said, actually, what a lot of Christians call it is really defined as the gift of suspicion, where you're like suspicious of people's motives, you know. And he said, if they would turn that gift upon themselves for 12 months, they would quit using it. But it's not, it's the gift of, it's discerning of spirits. It's seeing or discerning into the realm of spirits. It's, right? The Bible says in the last days, God will pour out a spirit upon all flesh. They will, young men will have visions, old men dream dreams. It's seeing into the spirit realm. Ananias saw Jesus in the spirit realm. Angel appeared to Paul. Angel appeared to Philip. Angels appeared to a lot of people, and they saw into the spirit realm, and they saw a spirit being. Spirit beings are there, and they're real, but your natural eyes don't perceive them unless you have a manifestation of the gifts of the spirit, discerning spirits. Those are three gifts that reveal. Three gifts that demonstrate power, special faith, gifts of healings. Both of those words are plural and working of miracles. Special faith is described by many as uh, God's faith working through you to receive a particular miracle. In other words, you couldn't doubt if you tried because God's faith is being used through you. Now you can grow your own faith and you should. The Bible talks about exceedingly growing faith. But this is a manifestation of the Spirit of God where you say, man, I can't even doubt that this is going to happen, right? It's a manifestation. And then uh, the manifestations of speech or utterance is uh, tongues, interpretation of tongues, and prophecy. Now, this is speaking specifically in a, like a church setting or a public setting where praying in tongues should be done regularly and daily by every Christian filled with the Holy Spirit in their own devotional prayer life. And Paul defines that in 1 Corinthians 14, verse 18. He says, I speak in tongues more than all of you Corinthians put together, yet in the church I speak in a, in a language we understand. So Paul said most of his praying in tongues is done privately. But then there's the manifestation of tongues and interpretation where it's a gift of the Spirit where the Holy Spirit communicates something. It's inspired utterance in an unknown tongue and then the inspired interpretation and then prophecy is inspired utterance in a known language. And so these are the gifts of the Spirit. These are tools. Real quick, let's close with this. Uh, these two, uh, or these, these uh, gifts of the Spirit can be summed up <clears throat> that two things we should have an attitude towards them is number one, we should covet earnestly, Paul said, the best gift. In other words, we should crave, we should desire, we should hunger for God to manifest this way in our day, in our generation, and in our lives, that we refuse to see any less of God than he's made available to mankind. Paul said, covet earnestly. Then he said, yet I show you a more excellent way, which is what we talked about last week in the first service. We didn't do, we were supposed to do it in the second service. We went a different way. I show you a more excellent way, love. In other words, you let love be your motivation for hungering to see these things and your life will be filled with the manifestations of the gifts of the Spirit. You'll find them working in your life wherever you go. Amen. Right? Amen. God working through you because you're just, your motive is love. It's not to be seen, right? 
we think it'd be cool to have a gift of the Spirit until you actually have one and it scares you like it happened to me. I was like, mm, nope, sorry. But if our motive is love, not fear, not love, love's our motive, and we hunger, we'll see him. So I told this to the first service, I think it'd be appropriate to say here, is let's let this attitude infiltrate us as a church. That in our prayers as a church, we begin to pray, God, we want to see you manifest this way. We hunger for it, we crave it, and we expect it. Amen. Let's pray that way. We're not begging him to do something. We're just saying, God, we want all of who you are. So we expect, I don't need to be the one doing it. Whoever you use is fine with me. Just manifest yourself in these ways. Amen? Amen. 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 Praise God. Praise the Lord. These, these messages on the supernatural church have been phenomenal teaching. And um, I know Pastor Chris said it there at the end, but just speaking personally, I do have an expectation that we'll see. I mean, you know, the, the global church, it will happen. But I also have the expectancy that right here in London, Kentucky, at Redemption Life Center, just as we pray, as he asks us to, when we give that to God, I believe we'll see that right here. I have, a, I have a tremendous expectancy for that. I mean, I expect it every time that I come through these doors, that I'll see it here, but also there, out there. You know, it's not just going to be inside these four walls, but we'll see this out there, and it is for the believer, not just for the Apostle, prophet, evangelist, pastor, teacher. It's for the believer. Well, I'm not going to re-preach or re-teach what he said, but um, great teaching. And I'm telling you, just have the expectancy that God's going to do it. Amen? And we'll see it. Um, we want to give you an opportunity to give this morning. We appreciate your generosity in giving. Um, if you're making out a check, you can make it to RLC. If you're giving cash, there's an envelope in front of you that you can use for that. Um, since we don't have the monitors, I'll give you the number for text giving in case you don't have it. And that number to give by text is 606-644-5484. Or you can give online at redemptionlife.center. You know, I, I thank God for every blessing that he's given to me. I'm so grateful for it. Um, when I was uh, younger, in my 20s, I made a statement when I began to work full-time. I made a statement that by the time I was 35, I was going to be a millionaire. That was what I said. But I was going to be that millionaire my way. I was going to do it my way. I knew what to do. I knew how to get there. And when I turned 35, I was not there. It was my way. Well, a few years before I turned 35, I walked through these doors and began to hear the Word of God taught about giving and receiving and about, many, about all, the, all these other truths from the Word of God. And I began to see I needed to change because financially I was sick. I mean, I was sick financially. Our family was. We weren't making any progress. We were going backwards, going backwards financially. And I began to see the truth from the Word of God that God wants to bless us. You know, God wants to bless us more than we want the blessing. And if you think about for a minute, think about how much you want God to bless you. We all do that. We all want God to bless us. He wants to bless us more than we desire the blessing. So I began to, to see these truths and I began to work them. And I'm telling you, it, it, the, the Word absolutely works not just because it was me, but it will work for any person that will believe it and act on it. And one thing that I did, that I learned, that in every blessing, financial, physical, spiritual, whatever it was, I wanted to remember God. It was God that provided it. It was through Him, by Him. And in Deuteronomy 8:18, the Bible says, but you shall earnestly remember the Lord your God, for it is He that gives you power to get wealth that He may establish His covenant. That word power means abundant, I mean, it means ability and means to produce. I made this statement in the first service, and I've said it before, is that no matter what place I'm at in my life, when I retire 
and I'm sitting at home on the couch, I'm never going to make the statement that I am on a fixed income. I'm not going to say that. If I say that, then I've limited God to whatever I get. Listen, God, God gives us, no matter where we are or in what situation of life, we have the means to produce abundant supply, abundant substance, and abundant riches. And that's what that word wealth means. It is God that gives us the means to produce riches. Why? In order that he may establish his covenant. And the second thing I learned is that in my financial life, I'm going to remember him, but I'm also going to give to advance the kingdom. God is first financially. He's first financially. When that happens, when we decide that we're going to make him first financially, all the needs that we have in this natural world, the bills that we have to have paid, the things we like to do, trips we like to take, going out to eat, all those things will be taken care of when God is first in our finances. It works. I'll earnestly remember God. He's the one that is my provider. Amen? Amen. Praise the Lord. Ushers, you can receive the offering. Listen, we're so thankful for your giving. Um, one thing that I did want to mention to you is we, we have a lot of things going on up here, you know, where we, we are reworking the stage up here. And so instead of having, and there's other things that are going to happen, but instead of having a project coming to you with every single project and saying, well, this is what we need, this is what we need, this is what we need. We have a renovation fund. And if you want to bless that and give into that to help fund these things and all these things that we're doing is to promote the kingdom of God. It's not just to have something fancy and nice. It'll be nice. It'll be good. But doesn't God deserve our very best? He deserves excellence from us. And so if you want to give into that fund, you can sow a seed there. If, if you're out of check, you can just put renovation fund or cash envelope, whatever, and you can give into that. Before we go this morning, I'd like to give anyone here or anyone watching online the opportunity to accept Christ as Savior and Lord. The greatest miracle that you'll ever see is when a person accepts Christ and is born again. I'll never forget the person. Uh, I mean, I've led many people to God, but that just recently we led a person to the Lord at Recovery Works. And when I saw him walk in, he was just, I mean, he was hard. He had a hard look, a hard spirit. But as he listened to the message that God loved him, that God was not there to condemn him, and we began to to promote that and preach that and teach that, you could just see him change. And he came up and he wanted, he wanted to come back to God. I mean, he didn't know, he didn't even know he could. He just wondered if he even could come back to God. But he gave his heart back to God and just, a, just such a dramatic change in his countenance. But that's what God does. And it's a miracle, the greatest miracle you'll ever see. So if that's you watching online or you here, we're going to pray a simple prayer together. And if you pray this prayer, you're going to be born again. Let's bow our heads and pray this after me. Father, I come to you in Jesus' name. I repent of my sins. I ask you, Jesus, to come into my heart and be my Lord. I thank you for saving me. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, if you prayed that prayer, you are born again. You're a brand new creature in Christ Jesus. And if you did that and you're watching online, please let us know. We'd like to help you as you begin your new life in Christ. Thank you for coming today. I know you've been blessed. Have a great week. We'll see you Wednesday night. God bless you. You're dismissed.